Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Shumacast. I am Noel, being joined, as always, by Angie. Hi, everybody. I apologize in advance for my cold. (laughs) Okay, you don't sound any worse than I did on the Falling Down episode. (laughs) We are going to finally wrap up the 90s in Joel Schumacher's career with the film Flawless. Yes. Just some quick production notes on this one. The late 90s were a bit of a tough time for Joel. After the reception of Batman and Robin, he had a lot of high-profile gigs that he was either taken off of, or they fell apart, or they never moved forward. We'll get into that more when we get into the Decade Wrap-Up episode, where we're going to look into some of those. 8mm, even though it's got a cult following now, and there were people who liked it at the time, didn't really help because it got mixed reviews, it only did okay at the box office, Mm -hmm. and it got bad publicity over the falling out that he had with the screenwriter, who was a very high-profile screenwriter at the time. So ultimately, offers just weren't coming in on projects for Joel, and I think he was also at a point where he was looking to do stuff that was more stripped down, low budget, fast and cheap, and so he decided Mm. to write his own original project again, which he hadn't done since the 80s. Yeah, quite a while. It's partially based on a friend of his who at the time had suffered a stroke and as part of his therapy had taken singing lessons. Okay. So the big name that Joel was hoping to get was Robert De Niro and he sent him the script, waited on pins and needles, not knowing what response he'd get. And he got the simple response, when do we start? Okay. And it's worth pointing out De Niro in this because De Niro and his production partner, Jane Rosenthal, run a production company called Tribeca Productions, which is also Mm -hmm. responsible for the uh, Tribeca Film Festival. Mm -hmm. While they do produce a lot of Robert De Niro's movies, they also produce a lot of really interesting indie dramas, a lot of focus on queer cinema, a lot of focus on minority cinema. Okay. A lot of really interesting stuff in their catalog. And he really took this under his wing and allowed Joel to have the freedom and control to do this without having to worry about studio interference. Okay. And that's really all I have for the production. Do you want to go ahead and take us into the synopsis? Sure. Walt is a retired policeman with a good reputation thanks to stopping a bank heist some years ago. He lives in a rundown apartment complex and judges the prostitutes, drug addicts, and drag queens who live there with him, even though he frequently visits a gentleman's dance club and basically pays for sex. A drug deal goes wrong in the neighborhood, and the young man who stole the cash hides out in the apartment complex. When Walt hears a commotion upstairs, he goes to help, but ends up suffering a stroke. He loses movement on his right side, and his speech is strongly impaired. His doctor convinces him to take physical therapy, and his therapist recommends taking singing lessons to improve his speech. He turns to the drag queen upstairs for this when he realizes he can't make it across town to anyone else. He has been calling his neighbor slurs over and over again up to this point, so Rusty, the drag queen, is reluctant to help and only agrees to in order to accept the money. The drug dealers are also frequently returning to the apartment complex looking for who may now have the cash, since the young man and his girlfriend are dead and they couldn't find the money there. The apartment manager assists them, and they initially track down a drug addict and a musician, but neither of them have the cash, so they start to suspect it may be the manager just playing with them. They threaten his mother and tell him he needs to find them the cash immediately. During this, Walt and Rusty begin to know each other a little better, though not exactly understand each other. Rusty has a boyfriend who frequently comes to her for gambling money, though she swears he's also really sweet at times. She's using the cash she gets from Walt to save up for hormone treatments and an operation so she can fully transition. Walt is a pretty big jackass about this as a whole, but the two of them still form a friendship. Walt realizes that he was just kidding himself that the dancer he was seeing actually liked him when he tells her he can't give her money anymore. Another dancer at the club who always liked him, but he called a whore, comes to visit him but walks out when he accuses her of just pitying him. Walt is also frequently visited by a former co-worker on the force who can't be bothered to learn the name of the black physical therapist who is treating Walt and generally says nasty things about the drag queens. 
Walt finishes his singing lessons with Rusty and they throw him a big party where the cops and drag queens and doctors all have a good time. And at the end of the night, when it's just the two of them alone, Rusty admits to Walt that she has the money from the drug deal and she's going to use it for her transition. Walt is mad because his white cis man pride is hurt and walks out. He reconnects with the dancer who was nice to him and she dances with him again and even sleeps with him. They have a conversation afterward where Walt repeats some words that Rusty said to him and the dancer says, she sounds like a really good friend. The apartment manager starts snooping through the tenant's mail and discovers the deposit Rusty has put down toward her transition. He tells the drug dealer she must have the cash and even advises Walt to just ignore any sounds he may hear that night. Walt does not ignore it and comes to Rusty's rescue. There is a struggle. Walt locks himself in Rusty's bedroom, desperately trying to find the phone to call the police. And Rusty jumps out the window and climbs outside the building to get into the bedroom. The drug dealer busts in and the two of them manage to overpower him and kill him, though Walt is shot in the shoulder during the fight. Walt is loaded onto an ambulance and Rusty insists on coming along, claiming to be his sister. The EMTs look to Walt for confirmation and he says, he's my sister, so they let her ride along. While they are originally going to bring him to the community hospital, she pulls out a bunch of cast and insists they bring him to the nicest hospital uptown. The end. All right. (laughs) So had you ever seen this film before and do you recommend it now? I had not even heard of it before. Mm -hmm. I know you said it has a limited release, which makes Mm -hmm. a lot of sense because this was a time when I was going to the movie theater like all the time. And yeah, I had never even heard about it. So I guess it never made its way shock and horror to Louisiana. I had certainly never heard of it. It sounded like an interesting concept, but as probably given away by my synopsis, I ultimately don't recommend it. I don't really like Walt as a character, and I don't really feel like he's redeemed by the end of this. You can't really blame some of the, I guess, terms and Mm. definitions here when it comes to trans versus drag queen, because I feel like this was a time when those two terms were very much sort of intertwined and people didn't entirely understand it all. But it's missing the heart that it really needs, and it's missing more of a realization from Walt for me to really get behind it and its message. Yeah, I do recommend it, but mildly. Mm -hmm. It's a film that is just kind of messy and all over the place. Yeah. It feels like it's simultaneously trying to be this really focused story of these two people and also trying to be like a car wash amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill type ensemble of all the other kooky people in and around the building. Right. And I feel the biggest thing is because it's trying to do both, it's not really allowing either one enough room to fully flesh itself out. Yeah. Like the central relationship, I like a lot of what's there, but again, it's missing just this one extra push or this one extra step to fully go as deep and fulfill itself as it can. Mm -hmm. And the ensemble bits are so quick and spread. Erratic, mm-hmm. it's not as well honed of a script as a car washer amateur night were. Right, sure. But there's still a lot in there that I like. I like a lot of the individual scenes. I like the way it juggles the tones. I think it's very problematic, but in very intentional ways yeah. that are about exploring the problematic stuff. But even then, I don't think it goes quite as deep as it could. Mm-hmm. But I like the performances. I think it's really fun. I love the gay Republicans. <laughs> There's a lot of individual stuff that I like in this film, even if it doesn't Mm. all quite come together. I liked it more than I did say in Almost Fire, which was another film that didn't all come together and didn't go as far as it could. Mm -hmm. But I also didn't like a lot of the individual pieces. (laughs) I still enjoy a lot of the stuff there. And I watched it twice for this and I still enjoyed it the second time. I'm not loving it. I'm not enraptured by it. But I enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. And I forgot to mention that I did know of this film. I remembered seeing the trailers for it back when it was okay. first coming out. Of course, it was never out. I never went and saw it. I don't even think I knew it was a Joel Schumacher film until we researched for this. Mm. I didn't know at all that it was like the first film that he wrote in over a decade. Yeah, It's one where I don't love it, but there's enough there for me to enjoy that I think it's an interesting curiosity that people can get something out of if they check it out. Mm. Let's go ahead and focus on, I mean, you said you had your issues with Walt. Yeah. Just straight from the get-go, pre-stroke, I feel Mm -hmm. like the movie kind of wanted me to buy into his reputation and how well-regarded he was, but he's being awful to the people that live in this apartment with him. 
And then he's going to this club and it's like, okay, clearly these women are basically prostitutes. Oh yeah, it's a dance hall. So why are you treating your neighbors like shit and then just because these ladies wear slightly nicer dresses... I just didn't like him from the word go. And I don't know mm -hmm. that you were necessarily supposed to find him likable. I mean, it's not that De Niro's giving a bad performance. I mean, he's Robert De Niro. He's always bringing in 110%. But I just don't ever feel like this guy warms up in any way. You know, it's like, oh, well, my new lady friend said that this person sounds nice. So I guess I'll be nice to her now. It doesn't seem like he ever really respects Rusty and her identity and her who she is, you know what I mean? Right. I think if it had ended with, she's my sister instead of he's my sister. Right. That would have been nice. And then the whole line of, good thing you didn't cut your balls off. Yeah. I mean, that's at least funny. Yeah. And irreverent, but it is kind of, yeah. I mean, it's not great either. Right. The reason why it works for me is that, no, he's not likable, but he's definitely a person who buys into the image of his own machismo. Mm -hmm. You know, he's the fit guy who goes and, like, can outplay younger people at the park. You know, he's got this whole legendary hero status at work. Yes, he's obviously paying for sex, but I think he's allowed himself to delude himself that he's not. Yeah. He is someone who is definitely in the midst of the delusion of machismo. Mm -hmm. You know, to go ahead and throw the term toxic masculinity, he buys into the right. idea that he is the macho man. I think that's why when he has the stroke, he becomes so deeply insecure about everything that he's lost, mm -hmm. even though a lot of that was just kind of meaningless illusion yeah. that didn't really define you at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, I think the thing that defines him the most, going back to the story and then even the night that he has the stroke and then in the third act, is he sees someone in danger and he goes to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the girl upstairs who ended up getting killed was a prostitute. He often made fun of her for that. But he hears her in danger. He hears the gunshots. He grabs his gun and he goes upstairs to try to help. Mm -hmm. For everything that he builds up, all these barriers to the people around him, all the discrimination, his own disillusionment and buying into his macho image, he's someone who will go help someone who needs it. And I think that's supposed to be the moment where it's like, okay, there's something here worth saving. <sighs> yeah. I mean, it still doesn't really redeem him, right? No, no. It's never always supposed to be about redemption. It's supposed to be about growth. Yeah, yeah. And I think the film needed to have more growth. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, there's always these scenes where he's with his old partner or his friends at the poker table, and they start making fun of him hanging around with the drag queens. Yeah. And he's still always, like, uncomfortable and dodges around it. There's never a moment where he seems to be like, you know, hey, they're good people. Mm -hmm. Right. And oddly enough, it's like we jump over that moment moment to the party where they're all hanging out and dancing together. Yeah, it's so not earned. Yeah. It's like we miss something in those montage scenes yeah. that we probably should have seen to build that connection there. Yeah, I mean, especially like his friend goes from making fun of the drag queens to then literally slapping the ass of one while grinding with her. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad that Mark Margolis's character wasn't at that party because that really wouldn't have fit. Yeah. They were at least aware enough to be like, okay, yeah, the one who's truly awfully bigoted should not be here. But yeah, yeah, I mean, Tommy was also pretty bad and suddenly he's okay with it. Hey, what's your name? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a film where I think it's very mixed messages and it's like, I see where the arcs are, but yeah, it's missing steps in terms of like getting you to that arc. Right. And honestly, I read the screenplay to this. It's not missing anything. Pretty much everything mm -hmm. that was in the script is on screen. They didn't really cut anything. Uh -huh. In fact, they actually added a little bit more in the third act. Okay. There's just more action stuff. Gotcha. It's odd in that it feels like it's got these really great ideas and moments, but I don't know that he really sat down to finesse the script enough. Yeah. The script I also enjoyed reading, but even then reading the script, mm -hmm. it was still very choppy and kind of all over the place, but I still like all the bits. Right, right. I like that idea of Walter's arc, and I like the idea that, again, when Rusty reveals that to him, it was more, wait, you used my condition and my money as cover for you. There needed to be more to that confrontation, I think. Yeah. It felt like he was overreacting to nothing almost, you know? It was like, how yeah. dare you? And it's like, well, but it's really not that big a deal. Like, what did you want her to do, get killed by the drug right. dealers? That is one bit that's missing from the script is that scene had more emphasis on, you took my money. Mm. Literally, the only thing I could afford to do now was pay for therapy, and you didn't need that money to give me that therapy. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it didn't really highlight that in the same way that it had earlier when he was speaking to his dancer about yeah. how he had no money left. 
Well, you'd think if he's retired with a pension, you'd have some level of insurance. Granted, the American system doesn't always support that. Right, right. I do still think De Niro gave a good performance, though. What do you think mm -hmm. about his performance? Yeah, no, he, like I said, I mean, he does a good job. I think he, in his typical way, he probably studied people with strokes to make sure that he was getting a pretty accurate portrayal because it was believable. Oh, yeah. He had weights on his wrist. He had lead soles on his right shoe. Okay. And he actually got fitted for a prosthesis in his mouth that mm. shifted the shape of his jaw and prevented him from doing certain movements. Gotcha. So it was like pressing down on his tongue and not allowing him to open his jaw. He went the full route, like to the point where right. he actually hurt himself a few times. <laughs> that sounds about right for him and what yeah. I've known of his method. But yeah, and I mean, I think he was certainly capable of creating a character who would have mm -hmm. had a little bit more pity to him, I guess, if anything. And I mean, the moment where he does fall down on the ice when he's trying to go to get the other yeah. singing lessons. I mean, that is heartbreaking. Right. And you feel his pain at his pride being hurt and not being able to do this anymore as much as the physical aspects of it. But I feel like it's just a problem with the character and how it's written that I'm just not seeing enough of a lesson being learned for him. Yeah, the biggest wall that he has to overcome is his own pride. Mm -hmm. But I don't know that he does. It's more or that no. the story reassures him that he's still a man, he can still dance, he can still get laid, he can still go dive into action. Right. And it's more right. about reassuring him more than it is removing the pride. Yeah, exactly. Like, that second dancer should not have taken him back. Yeah. Like, I get that they're trying to say, oh, well, you know, there will be some women who accept you for who you are, but right. I feel like he should have effectively burned that bridge and lost that connection, and he would have just had to have tried to find it with somebody else down the road. It goes and dances with Cha-Cha. <laughs> That would have been a real good lesson for him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, yeah, because yeah. I think showing that he's forming actual connections and comfort with these new people in his lives. And right. We get some of that at the party, but imagine if he had gone to the flawless competition. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's another thing like we were talking about, like there's a lot of little fun bits. Yeah. I love the flawless competition stuff, but it's like four minutes of the movie. <laughs> right. It's introduced, but we barely get to see it. We just see all the buildup leading up to it and then the results. But it's like, you couldn't throw in a couple more performances in there? I think it would have been fun. I mean, honestly, if he had done like an amateur night at the Dixie Bar and Grill style movie centered entirely around the flawless competition. Right. I would be on board with that so much. Yeah. Because every time they cut to the flawless competition stuff, it's comedy gold. Mm -hmm. But in like really fun, satirical ways. I mean, like a fight breaks out between the two rival gangs of drag queens. Quick, send in the butch lesbians. Well, no, wait. First he says, I need the I, butch gays, I think. And then he says, send in the lesbians. I didn't want to say the actual words. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Gotcha. This film uses a lot of frank terminology that I do not want to be the one to quote. Yeah, that's true. There are things that are said by some of the characters that the characters can say, but we can't really say. Yeah. And a lot of it is really sharp, witty lines and are funny. And what I like about this film is, and this is where I kind of mean it's on paper, a lot of this stuff would be seen as problematic, but the way in mm -hmm. which it's used is with a frank authenticity. Right. And often most of the queer characters, when they have slurs thrown against them are often given the final word when they get to throw something back. Yes. And I think he definitely was doing his best to represent that community and casting a lot of people who are authentic to that. Yes. I wish Philip Seymour Hoffman's character could have been a little more authentic, maybe. Yeah. But then it was also a little distracting at times, like when there's the whole conversation between the gay Republicans and the drag queens. It's like, this is just you getting on a soapbox right now. Which I'm fine with because it's funny. I mean, yeah, it just doesn't necessarily fit in with the rest of the film. No, but it's definitely one of those ones where he's juggling a lot of tones here. Like, there's a lot of right. really sad, hard stuff going on. There's a lot mm -hmm. of confrontation, a lot of anger, a lot of heart and warmth, a lot of funniness. And whenever you're getting the flawless competition, he's going full camp. Oh, yeah. But again, I don't really mind a film that juggles tones. Again, it's just I don't feel each of the threads really had enough breathing room. Right. In order to make those tones really stand out. Because again, like, you know, Car Wash, yeah. one of the things I liked about it was it could get very sad and very dark at times, even as it was this silly, funny ensemble comedy. Mm -hmm. And this one, it feels like it's more sad with moments of funny. Yeah. Again, like, I wish we'd had more of the flawless competition. I love the gay Republican scene. Just doing a whole biting satire 
satire of a competition like that, I'm on board mm-hmm. with. But again, it's like such a small part of this film. It kind of leaves me wanting more. Yeah, I think that would have said a lot if he had gotten to the point where he was supporting Rusty so much that he went to that. Yeah. Not only would you have brought those threads together, but you would have shown some real growth for him. And maybe Tommy could have come too, you know? Yeah. Instead of having that separate party. I would end the movie with the party, you yeah. Know, maybe the pizza boy could have come for that too. I don't know. The pizza boy, <laughs> I kind of felt bad for him. I kind of felt like he was being molested there. In the end, though, he did seem into it, but still... <laughs> The way it started. The way it started, yes. Yeah, the way it started was a little odd. By the way, that one just has one of my favorite lines. Rusty, I shot my best friend in the tit with my cufflinks. (laughs) There's so many things in here that I want more of. And the fact is that Mm -hmm. because it has so much going on, you don't get enough of everything. Right. And not in a way that feels like intentionally like we're just getting moments. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, I definitely don't want another film like Cousin Cousine, where it's like all moments. Right. And I don't know. It's one I'd just like to see them work on the script a little more, just hone it more. Yeah. Because some of the scenes between Rusty and Walt, while the content is good, do go on a bit long. Yeah. And you could have tightened them a bit in order to give a little more breathing room to some of the other aspects of the story. I'm just going to go ahead and assume that he was really enjoying those scenes. For instance, the whole name game over the credits. Yeah. I'm like, this isn't really funny. I liked it just on a character level. It's such a, like, fifth grade idea of, like, let's do fuck in the middle of the name game. Like, I didn't need fuck and bastard and prick, I guess, is what I'm coming. Like, I know it was just the credits, but it was still kind of like, you're a little too proud of yourself right now. And that was just one of those scenes where he obviously just let the camera go and let the actors just run with it. That's actually a scene where I'm glad they included it because you can see the two of them having fun with each other. But then it should be in the movie. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. That's the biggest thing is until the party scene, we never really see him laughing at any of Rusty's jokes. He always looks uncomfortable. Right. You know, and that's one of the moments where they're both kind of riffing off of each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree. It's like the film needed us to see that as part of the development. Yeah. I mean, like in the whole scene where, you know, Cha-Cha comes crashing in while he's getting his therapy and has his friend there you know instead right. of like just instantly like looking shocked and horror i mean you can have him be uncomfortable but you know when chacha's holding up the dress what do you think he could have had a line like i thought you were gonna go with the blue one mm-hmm. something like that that shows that he actually does pay some attention to these people right. that are now a part of his life yeah that he was building a connection and not just that chacha was being yeah. almost a little stalkery or something breaking into his apartment without asking yeah yeah and then like when she leaves and it was a tommy uh-huh. who was laughing his ass off saying i never right. thought i lived today to see this and he says well you should have seen her in the blue dress (laughs) right yeah something i think yeah it needed to have more of this is now a part of his life these are the people who are part of his life right so i think that's definitely what the film is missing well, and especially because he goes right back to throwing the slurs yeah. the moment he gets upset. It's like he's literally learned nothing yeah. and saying the awful stuff like, oh, well, why would you want to be an ugly woman? And yeah. there's just nothing in this character to me that shows he's changing. Right. I remember in the script, Rusty actually had a comeback to that line. But in this one, it's like mm-hmm. Rusty's fallen asleep. And so it's like that line just lingers. Yeah. It's like touching on something, but it's not going all the way. Right. Let's go ahead and just shift over to Philip Seymour Hoffman as Rusty. Sure. As I said, anytime you do these kind of things, it's like, you clearly know lots of gay men. (laughs) You could have at least had a gay man in the performance. A trans person would have been even better. That said, we got what we got. You know, he does a really good job. He's clearly getting into the role and you believe him 110% as this character. I think Rusty is definitely the more sympathetic of the two. She still makes decisions that make you scratch your head, but you can relate to why she's doing what she's doing. I didn't necessarily feel betrayed when she revealed that she had the money. I mean, I think she had a very good reason for hiding it, and she was doing the smart thing of keeping it hidden. The fact that she was taking Walt's money, too, I don't think it was really that big a deal by comparison. All she had to do was say, here, I'll pay you back. Right, right. According to Joel, he did actually audition quite a few drag and trans actors for it. Okay. In fact, the two actors who play her friends, not Chacha, but the other two. Okay. I think it was American Grace and Ivana Mann. Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, yes. 
they both actually did audition for that role. Okay. And honestly, I could see either one. I know Joel was worried about getting an unknown to hold mm. her own against De Niro. Okay. Honestly, I'm like, De Niro has worked up sit unknowns before and has always been very open to helping them. Right. I think part of it was also Philip Seymour Hoffman had heard about the role, auditioned for it. Joel just mm. said the acting was on another level that yeah. made him want to do it. And Philip Seymour Hoffman was just breaking out. He had been acting for a while, but only in like bit parts like Dusty and Twister and stuff like that mm -hmm. and had just done Boogie Nights. Okay. And the same year was also in Talented Mr. Ripley. Even in the mm -hmm. indie scene, he was starting to really break out into some meaty roles. And this was a yeah. time when his star was really shooting up. Uh -huh. So I understand it from that perspective. But yeah, no, this would absolutely have been a great role to highlight someone from that community who wouldn't otherwise get this opportunity. Right. And even then, there's times when I know he did put a lot of work into his research, into the voice, into the body movements and stuff. Mm -hmm. There are still times where it is a little stereotypy. Yeah. Especially with the hands. But I think he's putting a lot of thought and work into it. It's one of those ones where it's like, I wish there were circumstances that could have made this a little bit better, but it's still really good. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I like about Rusty is one of the strengths and flaws of her is that she always stands her ground. But there are times when she's the one who's actually starting a fight by standing a ground. Like, again, the, the whole yeah. discussion of her having the money, she's the one who really starts throwing it at Walt first, which sets him off. That's true. Where he's just kind of like, wait, does this mean you used me? And then she's the one who snaps at him and kind of tears him down. And then, of course, he fires up. And I think they're both characters who have a lot of pride. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the strengths of Rusty is that she's a very hard person to tear down. And mm -hmm. even in the climax, she's the one who's taking a proactive action role mm -hmm. in some interesting ways. Yeah. But like a lot of this movie, it's like it's almost there. Right. That whole action sequence was a little confusing in general. Yeah. I get that he was looking for the phone, but other than the fact that they had set up that steel door, mm -hmm. I didn't really see the point of him locking himself in the bedroom. He didn't have a gun. And then she's like climbing outside the building and it feels yeah. very much like, okay, we need a big action moment here. Yeah. So we're going to have her climb outside the building, but ultimately where is she going and why? You know yeah. what I mean? It didn't make a whole lot of logical sense. It's a little bit much. Yeah. And again, didn't we already do this in St. Elmo's Fire when they're all trying to get into Demi Moore's apartment? <laughs> And even there, it was a little more funny because you had all the actors involved. Right. I mean, if it was like the entire team of drag queens trying to get into this apartment to take down the crooks, I'd be more on board. That'd be a little more amusing. Because you could build some more chaos out of it. Right. I mean, especially it's like you set up the gun cuff links. Let's pay them off. <laughs> No, they already paid off. She shot her friend in the chest. I know, but that's round two of the setup. And then the third one's going to be the payoff. I was kind of surprised. It's like they all seek shelter under the rain. And then it's like, okay, now they're going to go back out in the rain. It's like, no, send them up. Send them up. Yeah. Have the whole squad. Right. Yeah, that was a little weird. I mean, honestly, like it would be great to have a climax where it's like we've set up all these tenants in the building who are constantly being roughed up by these goons. What if mm -hmm. all of the tenants are kind of like en masse? Like you have the drag performers, you have the junkies, you have the guy who always is dating teenagers, you have the old lady in the wheelchair. Mm -hmm. It's like they all rise up against this. I did really love her. Stop, get away from my door. I'm going to call the police. As Rusty's pounding on her door, call, call the police. The police. Uh... <laughs> and then we find out that she did call the police. Yeah. She was just a funny character in general yeah. of like, what happened to you? I had a stroke. Oh, I didn't sleep a wink last night. <laughs> oh, clueless old lady. You gotta love it. Talking about the drag queens, they can't help it. They were born this way. It's something in the throat. <laughs> in the throat. Like, what does that even mean? What? <laughs> There's several movies that this could have been. You could have either just focused yeah. more solidly on the two-person character drama, mm -hmm. where again, like the climactic moment could be like him coming to her defense against her abusive boyfriend slash gigolo. Mm -hmm. That's really all you needed for a Walt to the Rescue sequence. Where, again, it's like he does and is hurt by it, and then she's the one who has to take the stand. Mm -hmm. You could have made something that's more focused on the actual character drama you've established there. Mm -hmm. Or you could have done more of a ensemble piece about how someone in this building has the money. Let's meet all these characters and stories in the building as they're trying to find the money. And then at the end, all these characters rise up to fight the bad guys. Well, and I think we've seen from watching all the movies that he, especially the ones he wrote and mm -hmm. directed before, his strength is definitely in those ensembles. Yeah. And so I have a feeling, you know, maybe he was trying to bring in these casts of characters 
One, because it's what he's good at. And one, yeah. because maybe he likes that kind of stuff. And, you know, in the same way that he hasn't really been very good at building that romance, maybe he's not as strong at building those one-on-one -on -one relationships. Right. And in this case, he wanted to tell a story of that one-on-one, -on -one, but it got kind of lost with everything else. Well, and I think one of the actual better romances that he's done was, again, not to keep going back to it, but Amateur Night at the Dixie Bar and Grill, where it was Dennis Quaid and the waitress, mm. where it's this really nice little relationship that has this full arc, even though it's only like 15 minutes minutes of screen time yeah. and is still a part of this broader ensemble. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, if you want to do a story about this whole community in a building and it's all about how they all have these walls and barriers, and then mm -hmm. what if the conservative and the drag queen having to spend time together ends up kind of taking down all the barriers in the building, ultimately culminating in them all coming together for the big party after they foil the goons? Yeah. You could do more to build an ensemble. Right. So what do you think about the landlord, the manager of the building? <laughs> Mommy... <laughs> Yeah, that whole thing. Did we really have to cast a large woman and put her in a moo moo? I mean, even though she wasn't actually in, she was only in a photo, but that was about as stereotypical of a little whiny put upon guy and his overbearing mother as you could possibly get. The whole thing with the bird. <laughs> though I do like the scene, the bird was kind of a comical punctuation to it, though I do like the yeah. scene of like, here's her glasses and her hearing aid and her teeth. Yeah. And he's just wondering what happened to this. And it's like, yeah, we just sent her down to Mickey D's to get some milkshakes, you know? <laughs> Honestly, do you think this film even needed the whole crime angle? No, not really. Like you were saying, the whole apartment complex is a bunch of people who are kind of down on their luck. Mm -hmm. So it would be very, very easy to have him go look for help for whatever it is that he ends up having the stroke the first time. And then, like you said, the boyfriend was kind of already there as a way for him to help Rusty at the end. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, it's like we don't really need this other subplot of the drug dealers continually trying to figure out where the money is. And like I said, because it wasn't really explored that well, you don't even really need that whole, oh, by the way, Rusty has the money the whole time aspect mm -hmm. either. So, yeah, it feels unnecessary. Also, for some reason, we get Chris Bauer doing a really bad Hispanic accent. I was like, really? What are you doing? And that's the guy who was the machine in 8mm, right? Right, right, yeah. exactly. So it's like, I guess you just worked with him and he probably wanted to work with him again. But you didn't have to make him Hispanic. Was he making him Hispanic or was it kind of like a Eastern European? I'm not really... Okay, to be honest, I don't know what kind of accent it was, but it was a very bad accent. It was an accent, yeah. It just felt really unnecessary. He could have just been a generic white thug and it would have been fine. Yeah, I mean, the crime angle, it's like, I don't think the actors are bad. Mm. There's some well-made sequences in it, but it's a lot like DC Cab, the whole mm -hmm. terrorist kidnapping plot that just comes out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. And then suddenly the entire third act becomes about that. Uh-huh. I think at least in DC Cab, it was more entertaining. Right. And in this one, it's at least more layered throughout the entire story, like from beginning mm -hmm. to end. True. But again, it's not an element that you need. Yeah, like the whole thing with the, oh, look, the musician suddenly has a lot of money. He's got a motorcycle. Oh, I've been dealing drugs for somebody else. Like, what? Yeah. That was, what? okay, yeah, I don't need any of this. Yeah. By the way, the musician who every time a girlfriend breaks up with him, we hold on right. him for two minutes as he's making up a terrible song. His really bad <laughs> song. Well, during the second one, I'm like, oh, see, Walt could have just gone to him for singing lessons. <laughs> he didn't even have to face his fears now. I would send him to Rusty for songwriting lessons. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and then it's even that so many of the characters aren't even in the building. It's, again, the pizzeria guy. They were cut out of the script, but there was more of the old Asian couple who run the market down the street. Who you, I think you just briefly oh, okay. see her at the party. Yeah, yeah, very, very briefly. They were more of a role in the script. I think most of their scenes were cut out because there wasn't much to okay. it. It was just, you know, like Walt would go pick up his groceries. Yeah. At the party, it was supposed to be like, she's like stoned out of her gourd. Then he comes halfway through just to swap shifts with her so she can okay. cover the market and he can party. <laughs> okay. Again, there's just so much more that you could have done to bring these pieces together and dig into them a little deeper. Yeah. I like what's there. I just wish it could be more. Mm-hmm. One thing that I did find interesting was the way this film was shot. Joel's done a lot of very clean camera work, and this one is shaky, gritty handheld camera. It fit the mood yeah. and the setting very much. I mean, it was very well done. Yeah. What it brought to mind of like 8mm was where he was either going to do like super low budget, gritty handheld with Russell Crowe, or he was going to do a more clean, polished studio movie. He did the more mm -hmm. clean, polished studio movie. I would yeah. love to have seen 8mm shot in this style. 
Yeah. Maybe that would have given that a little bit more of the energy that that was lacking. Right. I also looked up the cinematographer, Declan Quinn. He's only done a few films, like he did Leaving Las Vegas and Hot Tub Time Machine Part 2. Oh, God. But he's primarily a music video cinematographer, and he okay. did shoot Joel's music video for The End is the Beginning is the End. Mm. I don't know if he shot any of the others, because cinematography credits for music videos are very incomplete. Sure, yeah. But I mean, I really like the handheld style, and even, again, like mm -hmm. the scene playing over the end credits, even though it's just holding on actors improvising, it's constantly moving around them and doing interesting things. The only thing with the end credit sequence like that is it started to feel a little bit TV show to me. Hmm. Like a TV show's title sequence, especially since the actors' names were coming up. It was like, here's the full cast. Like that was the only part that stood out. But otherwise, I thought the cinematography was really well done. To be fair, I always like curtain call credits. Maybe it was because of the music going over it yeah. that it started to really get that feel for me. I mean, the best one is still Predator. <laughs> yeah. Which I remember as a joke, I did lay over a track from one of those TGIF <laughs> sitcoms. Yeah. And it worked perfectly. I'm sure it did. I think part of it is that it's doing a curtain call credits and it's this extended scene that just keeps playing on. Yeah. I would have shortened that. Uh -huh. We didn't need to have all of it, but it was still kind of fun just seeing the actors play off each other. Mm. But again, it was like highlighting an ensemble that we never really got to highlight. Yeah. And then we should mention Rusty's group of drag queen friends. Two of those were actual drag performers. The one who plays mm -hmm. Ivana... This is their only credit. Okay. So I don't know if they were using a stage name or not. Mm. And then the one playing Amazing Grace, that was credited as Nashom Benjamin, mm. who is more widely known as Nashom Wooden. Oh, man, I found so much history on him. <laughs> he was a singer who performed at a lot of clubs throughout the 80s and 90s and often did drag performances under the name Mona Foot. In the 90s, he and two other performers who were also DJs, they formed their own electronic disco band called The Ones. And while working on this film, Joel told Nishon that he can go ahead and submit music for the performance sequences. Unfortunately, a lot of it wasn't ultimately used in the finished film. Hmm. But the group The Ones came up with a dance track called Flawless. Did you have a chance to watch any of the videos that I sent? I did. I'm not a big fan of that style of electronic mm -hmm. where you only say one or two phrases over and over again with the same beat. Mm -hmm. But I did check it out and their dancing was certainly entertaining. Oh, yeah. Well, did you make it through to Nishom's rap solo? Oh, I guess I didn't. <laughs> It is largely one of those dance numbers where it's just repeating the same phrases. But then there is about like two minutes in, he does get a quick little rap solo and then okay. goes right back to what it was. Uh -huh. So this Flawless song, they ended up performing in clubs starting in 1989. And I'll put the video in the show notes. They're mm -hmm. wearing very skimpy, light up yes. sci-fi suits and are working the hell out of it. <laughs> it actually ended up becoming a popular song, especially in gay nightclubs in New York, and would be part of the regular rotation. And so they ended up recording and releasing it as a single in 2001, which did end up charting in the top 10 in Europe for several weeks, <laughs> and got them to actually go over to Europe, do a bunch of live shows, they got a music video out of it. And in 2004, George Michael licensed the song and basically just took the entire song, removed the rap solo, mm. and then laid in his own lyrics over it and then released yeah. that as a song also called Flawless, parentheses, go to the city. Yep, because that was the other line he injected for the most part. <laughs> yes. Which I remember that video when it aired in 2004. I remember seeing oh, really? it because it's this one okay. great single shot video of all these people in an apartment. Yeah. And then the ones are still together. Nishom Wooden does still perform. He's retired the drag character of Mona Foot and has been trying to do more solo work as Nishom Wooden. Okay. But the ones are still together. They have more mm. videos on YouTube, like I think going up to 2011, mm. and have actually had a number of other dance tracks that have been pretty popular in the clubs. Okay. Yeah, and then the actor who plays Cha-Cha is Wilson Germain Heredia. Bit of a character actor in TV, but has been very successful on Broadway. He was part of the original cast of Rent. Okay. And still does a lot of theater work. I actually kind of like Cha-Cha in this, of the kind of innocence uh -huh. of always calling him my left foot. Right. And then even buying him the videotape of my left foot. Uh-huh. And then bringing up Hunchback. Yeah. Have you ever seen Hunchback in Notre Dame? It's my favorite. Uh-huh. It's about a guy who's misshapen, worse than you, who falls in love with a gypsy girl who looks like me. <laughs> Like she's got such a crush on Walt. Subtle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, most of the other cast, the musician doesn't really get much outside of he dates teenagers and has money. Oh, yeah, that was so gross. The whole thing yeah. of like, yeah, wearing a uniform of high school or junior high. Oh, yeah, you know, one of those. Oh, yeah. 
How old is she? She's a Leo. Ugh. Yeah. Creepazoid. He's definitely like one of those guys who's in his late 20s but never left his teens and keeps trying to mm -hmm. stay there. Yeah. All the other characters are just kind of very incidental and I would mm -hmm. like to have had more. Yeah. I don't really have anything else to bring up on this one. No, I think that's it. Not much to say on the box office. Probably the most striking thing about this film is that it had a budget of $27 million. Really? That seems high. Yeah, I mean, I know it's a lot of costumes, but... Yeah, I mean, this feels like it should have been a 6 to $8 million. Right. It couldn't have been De Niro, like, asking for a ton because he, again, produced it under his indie label. Right. Which usually does use very low-budget films. Yeah. Philip Seymour Hoffman wasn't driving a high salary. Most of the cast is unknowns. They're local performers. Yeah. I'm wondering if maybe because they shot it in New York? Maybe so. I wonder if maybe there was an exorbitant fee demanded by the gay Republicans? <laughs> But yeah, it surprises me that this one cost as much as it did. And I'm wondering if that's partially what hurt it, because it only ever got a limited release hmm. and it only made $4.5 million at the box office. Oh, wow. We won't go like week by week because it opened at number 11. Hmm. But just kind of looking at some of the other stuff that was in theaters at the time, being John Malkovich, The Insider, Dogma, The Bone Collector, Sleepy Hollow, The World Is Not Enough. The first Pokemon movie, <laughs> which was at number five in its third week of release. That one actually did pretty well for an anime dub. Yeah. At number one was Toy Story 2, of course. Okay. And also opening that week at number three was the Arnold Schwarzenegger apocalypse action movie, End of Days. <laughs> So, but yeah, I mean, there's not much else to say. I mean, like, right below Flawless at number 12 was The Sixth Sense in its 17th week of release. Wow. So I guess they started with a limited release, hoping it would gain some interest, and then it didn't. Yeah. Yeah, that's a shame. It just didn't gain any traction. Kind of got mixed reviews. Not really bad reviews. I mean, like, even Roger yeah. Ebert gave it two stars, saying, again, I like a lot of stuff in here. It's just not all coming together. Mm -hmm. But I think it's one of those films where if you like Joel's early stuff, like DC Cab or Amateur Night or Car Wash or something like that, this is a nice yeah. film in that vein. It's not as good as any of those, but it's a another film along those lines. Right. Incredible Shrinking Woman is a film of a lot of fun pieces that don't all come together, and I still like it. It kind of reminds me of that. Yeah. Well, and that wraps up our decade of Joel, so we're going to actually be doing a decade wrap-up episode next. Yes. And the 90s were interesting. We'll talk about it. Yep, yep. All right, well, that's going to bring our episode to a close. Good night, everybody. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were both created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. <laughs>